Well, it's great to be back. We are nearing uh, the end of our year-long study on the way of faith. And as we continue today in this study of Hebrews chapter 11, we come to a very unique person in the Bible. And that is Samuel. Samuel. In Hebrews chapter 11, Samuel is mentioned in verse 32. This is the verse, first verse on our verse sheet. So let's all read this verse together. Hebrews 11.32, go. Now what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. Here is Samuel's name in what some people call the Faith Hall of Fame in the Bible. But who is Samuel? And why is Samuel here in Hebrews? What is his story? Well, his story begins with a man who had two wives. One was named Hannah, and the other was named Penina. Now, Penina bore children. She could have children. But Hannah uh, could not have children because the Bible said that Jehovah had shut up her womb. And so Penina would provoke her. You could say her rival would provoke her so that she would be so irritated concerning this matter of not being able to bear a child. And year by year, Hannah would go up to the house of Jehovah. She would not eat. And she would just weep and cry out to God. One year in particular, she went to the house of Jehovah, and she was very bitter in soul, and she cried out to God. And what she cried out to God is very specific and is very meaningful. And it's here in 1 Samuel 11.1. 1. Let's all read this also together. Go. She made a vow and said, O Jehovah of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your female servant and remember me and don't forget your female servant, but give your female servant a male child, and I will give him to Jehovah for all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. The priest who was overseeing the house of Jehovah at the time, his name was Eli. And Hannah, in her state of sorrow, you know, she was praying this prayer in her heart, and even her mouth was moving, but no sound was coming out. And Eli thought she was drunk, and he questioned her. And he, she responded, I have not drinking any wine or any strong drink, but I'm pouring out my soul to Jehovah. And so he told her, go and be at peace. May Jehovah grant you what you have asked for. First Samuel, Samuel 1.20 says, And in due time Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I asked for him of Jehovah. And then after some time, after Samuel was weaned, 1 Samuel 1, 27 through 28a says, It was for this child that I prayed, and Jehovah has granted me my request that I requested from him. Therefore I, for my part, have lent him to Jehovah. All the days that he lives, he is lent to Jehovah. So she kept her promise. She prayed if he would give her a son, she would give him to Jehovah. So this is a little bit about how Samuel came to be. But for a moment, I want to go back to her prayer, which will help us to understand who Samuel was and who he would become. First, 
it says that this prayer was a vow. And she made a vow. A vow is a promise. This vow consisted of a number of things. First she said to give her a male child. Then she said if the Lord did this, she would give him to Jehovah. She would give him to the Lord. And lastly, she said something very interesting. No razor shall come upon his head. Why would she say that? What was she getting at? Where did she get these words from? They're very specific words that probably none of us have ever used in a prayer to God. In order to understand this, we have to look at the Bible and consider where else these words are used. Interpreting the Bible with the Bible to understand what she was trying to get at here. In number 6, there is a special vow called the vow of a Nazarite. But let me step back and speak a little bit about the context here. In the Old Testament, God said that a certain group of people could be priests. Only this group of people. It was the house of Aaron of the Levites. Not all the Levites were the priests, but the house of Aaron. And only the house of Aaron. They were the only ones who could be priests. But what would happen if the house of Aaron became degraded? What would happen if they turned from God? What, if, what would happen if they became utterly corrupt? Could this happen? Well, it did happen at the time of Samuel. Actually, Eli, the priest, his sons were utterly corrupt. They were those who were supposed to go forth in the priesthood, but they were utterly corrupt. You see, God said that in the Old Testament, the house of Aaron were the only ones to be priests. But he added an in case of. He added this extra speaking in case the situation became degraded. And what is that in case of? That's the Nazarite vow. So I'd like us all to read. Actually, I'll just read the verses here in Numbers 6, 1 through 8. It says, Then Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man or a woman makes a special vow, the vow of a Nazarite, to separate himself to Jehovah, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, nor shall he drink any juice of grapes, nor eat fresh or dried grapes." And it goes on. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine, from the seeds even to the skin. All the days of his vow of separation, no razor shall pass over his head. These are Hannah's words. He shall be holy until the days are fulfilled, which he separated himself to Jehovah. He shall let the locks of his, the hair of his head grow long. All the days that he separates himself to Jehovah, he shall not come near a dead person. He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother or for his brother or for his sister when they die because his separation to God is upon his head. All the days of his separation, he is holy to Jehovah. There is a lot here. A lot of things that we'll get into in a moment. But I want to say this first. In the Old Testament, like I mentioned, only the house of Aaron could be priests. Males at that. But here, it creates an opening. An open door. A man or a woman someone from the house of Aaron or not. Anyone, anyone could be a Nazarite. 
The principle of the Nazarite vow is voluntary consecration, or in Hannah's words, a lending of yourself to God for His purpose. Samuel was not of the house of Aaron. He came in, you might say, through the side door. The front door became damaged. He came in through the side door. This is the story of Samuel. What about us here today? Will the Lord gain among us some Samuels, some Nazarites? I want to read a few verses. Romans 12.1 says this, I exhort you therefore, brothers, through the compassions of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Here Paul exhorts us, through the compassions of God, to present ourselves. To present ourselves. And he goes on to say this, which is your reasonable service. Why is this reasonable? Why is it reasonable to present ourselves to God without reservation? If we knew who this is, what He has done, and that He has a need, there is nothing more reasonable. This is the very God who created the heavens and the earth. Our Creator. He created us. This God did not stay far away from us. But He became a man by the name of Jesus. And He lived a perfect human life. A perfect, sinless human life in which He cared for man. He loved man and He ministered to man, even living as an example of the man that God desires. He lived a life of suffering. And after 33 and a half years, this one, this God-man, went to the cross in our place for our sins, and He hung there. He hung there. And He died. Because of His death, because His blood was shed, we can be forgiven of our sins. And through His death, we have been redeemed. To be redeemed means to be purchased. We all have been purchased Amen. with the precious blood that was shed on that cross. We're not our own. And furthermore, today, He is saving us in His life. He is in us as life and saving us day by day. This one has a need. This one has a need for his enemy to, to be defeated, for many people on this earth who have not heard of his salvation to hear of it. And he has a need to build up his church, the body of Christ. Will we give ourselves to him? The only, the only reasonable response is to offer ourselves wholeheartedly. No reservation. No reservation. The next verse, Psalm 110.3, says, Your people will offer themselves willingly in the day of your warfare, in the splendor of their consecration. Your young men will be to you like the dew from the womb of the dawn. This verse shows us that there is a warfare going on. And our Lord, whom we love, is in the midst of this warfare against His enemy and fighting for us, interceding for us day and night. And that in the midst of this warfare, those young men, young women, 
who give themselves to Him, who offer themselves willingly, are like refreshing dew. Are refreshing dew. Are we those who want to give our Lord a drink? Offer ourselves giving Him a drink? I want to spend the last uh, bit of time here focusing on a few specific things related to the Nazarite vow. To help us, that we can apply these verses that are very specific, but maybe a little bit hard to understand, to apply them to our situation. Okay? First, at the end of the second line in number 6, it's verse 3, it says, He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. He shall separate himself from wine and strong drink. Now in biblical typology, wine signifies earthly pleasures or worldly enjoyments. You know, it's so difficult with all of the worldly enjoyments around us, even so many of them focused directly at people your age, at college students. It's so hard to give ourselves to the Lord. You might ask, what is a worldly enjoyment? Well, I can't answer that question. What might be worldly for you may not be worldly for me and vice versa. We each know that there is something of worldly enjoyment that is keeping us from really giving ourselves to the Lord wholeheartedly. Although the Lord speaks in this Nazarite vow concerning separation from the worldly enjoyment, the wine, He does give us a way to counter it. How about we all read Ephesians 5, 18 through 19? Yeah. Go. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissoluteness, but be filled in spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and psalming with your hearts to the Lord. But be filled in spirit. We have to be filled with something. That's right. We're either filled with the worldly enjoyments or we're filled in spirit. But the Lord has given us the way. Amen. Be filled in spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and psalming with our hearts to the Lord. The Lord has given us our spirit. The Lord has given us one another. We're all struggling with this or that. We're all struggling with something. But if we can lean on one another, turn to one another, and speak these the wonderful words from the Bible and the wonderful words from the hymns that we sing. If we can gather together and enjoy the Lord together, this way we can be not filled with the outward worldly wine, but filled in spirit. Next, in this Nazarite vow, we come to the words that Hannah used in her prayer. No razor shall pass over his head. This morning, I don't have the time to get in detail into the verses, but if you want to jot them down, if you compare 1 Corinthians 11.14 with 1 Corinthians 11.15, you will see that this matter of the hair has to do with self-glory. Self-glory. As human beings, we are those who want to be uh, recognized for our good deeds. Whether it's that we're doing well in school and getting good grades, does God get the glory? Or maybe it's preaching the gospel, doing a good job. Maybe someone even got saved. Does God get the glory? As believers, we must be those who give God, give our God the glory. 
Look at 1 Timothy 1.17. It says, Now to the king of the ages, incorruptible, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Our God, our God gets the glory. A Nazarite is not only someone who is filled in spirit, but someone who gives God the glory. Next, in the Nazarite vow it says, He shall not come near a dead person. A dead person. What is the spiritual principle here? It is that we must be separated from spiritual deadness. Spiritual deadness. As Nazarites, we must be those who, when we come in contact with one another, are factors of life. 1 John 5.16 says, If anyone sees his brother sinning, he shall ask and he will give life to him. If anyone sees his brother sinning, we don't gossip, we don't talk so much about them, we don't discourage them, but we ask the Lord and we give life to them. We must be those who give life. We must be those who give life. And lastly, there's something here toward the end. It says, He shall not make himself unclean for his father or for his mother or for his brother or for his sister. This has to do with natural relationships. And this may be one of the most difficult items for some. Whether it's your best friend your roommate, or even someone as close as a family member, like here in the verse. Sometimes there are people can be, who can hinder us from fully giving ourselves to the Lord. And to illustrate this, I want to read you a story from a Christian in our history called Robert Morrison. He was the first Protestant missionary to China, and he was greatly used by the Lord. But at the beginning of his calling, he had a a difficulty, a decision that he had to make between following the Lord and following the pressure from one of his natural relationships that he cared for very much. Robert Morrison was now 20 years of age. And on November 24, 1802, shortly after his mother's death, he wrote to the Hoxton Academy, which was a training college for ministers in London, asking to be received as a candidate for the ministry. He was accepted at once, much against the wish of his father. He set sail for London. He stayed for two years as a student at Hoxton. Never once did he doubt he was following the right path. If he had done so, he would certainly have answered a letter he received from his father shortly after he had entered the college in a very different manner. The letter asking his son to give up his project and return home. It must have been very painful to Robert to receive this letter. But in answering it, he did not hesitate. He wrote and told his father what he felt. In more than one letter, having set my hand on the plow, this is quotes, this is what he's telling his father, having set my hand on the plow, I would not turn back, he wrote. I cannot help being much affected, so long as there is reason to suspect that you are offended with me. Your welfare in time and eternity is and I hope ever shall be near my heart. His two years at Hoxton cannot have been altogether happy ones. As he studied and worked, 
preaching sometimes in the villages around London, letters came at intervals, and each letter urged him to return. Robert, although his nature was stern and dour, had a strong affection for his family, and their lack of understanding greatly hurt him. But plead as they might, he would not yield. And all the time his thoughts were turning more and more toward the mission field. In his diary, he asked for guidance. Jesus, he wrote, I have given up myself to thy service. The question with me is where shall I serve thee? I learn from thy word that it is thy holy pleasure that the gospel shall be preached in all the world. My desire is, O Lord, to engage where the laborers are most wanted. Perhaps one part of the field is more difficult than the other. I am equally unfit for any. But through thy strengthening me, I can do all things. O Lord, guide me in this. Enable me to count the cost and having come to a resolution, to act consistently. A very difficult situation with a family member. Here, Robert Morrison had to make a decision. And he went on. He gave himself to the Lord. And like I said earlier, he became the first Protestant missionary to China. He wrote the first tr- he he produced the first translation of the Bible into Chinese and wrote hundreds of gospel tracts paving the way for everyone who would come after him to this place to preach the gospel to the nations. You see this brother was used by the Lord, but early on in his calling there could have been a hindrance. Now to be clear, the Bible teaches that we love our brothers and sisters, and that we honor our father and our mother. Yet at the same time, as Nazarites, we must be those who give the Lord the first place in all things. The last verse on our verse sheet, let's read this together. Colossians 1.18, go. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that he himself might have the first place in all things. That he himself might have the first place in all things. This is who Samuel was. And this is the way he lived. Throughout his life, he lived the life of a Nazarite. One who was separated from the worldly enjoyment, but who was always filled with God. One who did not seek self-glory, but gave the glory to God. One who separated himself from spiritual deadness and was a factor of life among God's people and one who gave the Lord the first place in all things. Will the Lord gain some Nazarites among us? I hope that many of us would take this word to heart and that we would go before the Lord and pray and offer ourselves to the Lord for His purpose. Being those today in this age where the Lord has a need. Being those who are filled in spirit, who give God the glory, are a factor of life, and who give the Lord the first place. May the Lord gain many Samuels, many Nazarites among us in this age. 